Welcome once again to the Sunday morning Bible study from Pikes Peak Church of Christ here in Colorado Springs. We continue our online presence this morning because many of you have continued to make the decision to stay at home because of the fear of infection with the COVID-19 virus. And we understand that concern. And as we've said before, we will continue our online presence until we're all back together again and all of this uh, virus issue is behind us. We'll begin in 2 John chapter 9 if you want to get there in your Bibles. <clears throat> but before we start, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, for the way it instructs us, it encourages us, and at times chastises us when it's needed. Father, we know you wrote it for our benefit, for our good. And we pray, Father, as we study it this morning, that it will have some insight into our lives. It will help us to be better and live better and do better in your sight. Father, we pray for those who are sick that you'll watch over and bless them with a speedy recovery, especially those who've contracted the virus. For those who are staying at home and are limited in their movement, we pray you'll be with them and encourage them during that difficult time. Father, help us to always remember that we are in your care, that you love us, that you're watching over us, and that no matter what's going on in the world, we can have joy in you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our text this morning begins in verse 9, and it says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. 
If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. For he who greets him shares his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. <clears throat> that idea there when he talks about transgresses, whoever transgresses. Some of the other versions translate that slightly in a slightly different way. Uh, this here in the New International, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. A New American Standard, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. The Contemporary English Version, don't keep changing what you were taught about Christ or else God will no longer be with you. But if you hold firmly to what you were taught, both the Father and the Son will be with you. And then one more, the New Living Translation. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. <clears throat> so this idea of transgresses or runs ahead, goes too far, don't keep changing, wanders away. This is a continuation of what we discussed last week, the idea of walking in the truth, the idea of walking in the commandments. You who have kids probably remember the times, maybe hundreds of times, when you were at the store or the park or the zoo, and you had to keep telling your kids, don't get too far ahead, come back here, you stay right beside mom and dad. And we did that because kids are oblivious to the dangers around them. They just wanted to see the next thing and they were excited about it. And you, as a parent, wanted to keep your eyes on them at all times so that you could protect them, so you could make sure they didn't get hurt, so you could make sure that something didn't happen to them. And so we understand how that works, and that's kind of the idea that John seems to be, uh, be suggesting here. It's the idea of running ahead of God, of going too far from God's sight, of changing, of, of wandering away. We go to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> And verse 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorned its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's the NIV, fixing our eyes on Jesus. We need to be where we can see Jesus. We need to be where, to use John's words in previous sections, we can see that which has been taught from the beginning. John's audience maybe was losing sight of that. False teachers, deceivers, antichrist. We're all teaching that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, and no doubt that was causing anxiety and concern in the church over well, what was the right doctrine, what are we supposed to be doing, what should we do, what shouldn't we do. John states that the correct doctrine was that Jesus did come in the flesh. Those who don't believe that have run ahead and are not continuing in the teachings of Christ, and they do not have God. He states that those who believe that Jesus came in the flesh have both the Father and the Son. And we ask how adamant was John about that particular doctrine? Well, you notice in your Bibles, verses 10 and 11, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And you read through that and you think, wow, that's harsh, isn't it? It's harsh to not allow someone into your house because he teaches something different than what you believe. But perhaps that's a, an indicator, a sign of how damaging this doctrine was to the church in John's day. It's a fundamental belief that John knew could not be undermined unless it undermined the church, lest it damaged the church. Why is that doctrine so important? Well, if you were with us last week, we discussed that very thing during the lesson, and I would encourage you to go back and watch last Sunday's class for more on what we're going to talk about this morning. It's right here on YouTube, easily accessible anytime you want to. We discussed four things that make this doctrine so important. And this morning, I want to add to that because there's more to it than just those four things we discussed, uh, we discussed last week. 
The idea that Jesus didn't come in the flesh manifests itself this way. If Jesus wasn't really human, then did he really suffer on the cross? Did he really die on the cross? Was he really tempted in all points as we are? I think the Antichrist would answer to that no. They would answer no to all of those questions. It only appeared in their mind that Jesus suffered and was tempted. In theological terms, it's been called docetism. Uh, the Greek word transliterated docetic means to seem. Jesus only seemed to suffer. Here's one of the definitions of the docetic belief. In theological terms, this has been called docetism. The Greek word that's translated docetic means to seem. Jesus only seemed to suffer. Here's a definition of the docetic belief. Docetism is broadly defined as any teaching that claims that Jesus' body was either absent or illusory. The term docetic is rather nebulous. Two varieties are widely known. In one verse, as in Marcionism, Christ was so divided that he could not have ever, or so divine that he could not have ever been human, since God lacked a material body, which therefore he could not suffer physically. Jesus only appeared to be a flesh and blood man. His body was a phantasm. Other groups who were accused of docetism held that Jesus was a man in the flesh, but Christ was a separate entity who entered Jesus' body in the form of a dove at his baptism, empowered him to perform miracles, and then abandoned him at his death on the cross. There are several historical documents that maybe help us understand the prevalence in John's day and the centuries that followed. These are non-canonical Christian texts. That means they're not in our Bible and have been rejected uh, as being in our Bible because they don't uh, follow the fundamental criteria of being inspired. But they're called the Acts of John, the Fundamental Epistle, Gnostic Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of Basilides, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Philip, the Second Treatise of the Great Seth. And you can look those up if you'd like to read those at some point later in time. Probably not real exciting reading, by the way. Let's illustrate it this way. In 2004, Mel Gibson directed a movie called The Passion of the Christ. If you haven't seen it, I won't necessarily recommend it to you, but if you have seen it, you'll remember the absolutely brutal portrayal of Jesus' scourging and death. I think it's perhaps the most graphic portrayal of that that I've ever seen in my life, and it's hard to watch, literally hard to watch. The docetics believe that Jesus suffered none of that. It only seemed that he did. It was an illusion. Or as we go back to the definition we read earlier, the man Jesus did suffer all of that, but Christ left him before that happened. Jim Cavazell was the actor who played Jesus in that film. Let's ask this question. Did Mr. Cavazell suffer in this movie? Did he suffer what Jesus suffered on the cross? And the answer to that was, well, of course not. It was Hollywood makeup and filming techniques. It was acting. In my mind, that's kind of how the docetic view plays out. Jesus was either an actor portraying a role or a real man called Jesus, who was brutally tortured and killed with Christ being absent. The bottom line in this belief, Jesus' death, according to the docetics, was style over substance. It was optics. It was a good show to illustrate the process of redemption, but the description of what happened in the Gospels does not accurately portray what actually happened. Let me use this really silly example. Let's say that tomorrow, in tomorrow's news, the National Hockey League was being disbanded and laws were being passed that there could be no more hockey played in the United States. Again, silly illustration, but bear with me. On Tuesday morning, a news crew from one of our local stations catches me coming out of the grocery store and asks me what I think about all this. And I could respond, well, I'm devastated. I don't know what I'm going to do. My whole world has been turned upside down. I can't sleep at night because of it. It would seem that I was upset by that response, right? Would I really be upset that I couldn't watch hockey anymore? Well, no. My apologies to all of you good people who are hockey fans, but I've never been a hockey fan. 
I don't really watch hockey. I have no desire to watch hockey. I have no interest in the game. When I channel surf on the TV and a hockey game pops up, I blow right on past it. So my response coming out of the grocery store seemed to indicate my devastation, but I wouldn't have been really devastated. My response would have been literally a lie. Jesus' death on the cross, if he just appeared to suffer, makes the entire Bible a lie. To me, that's why John is so worked up about the doctrine of Jesus not coming in the flesh. If it was all a staged show, then what are we to believe? Well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to put on a great show for humanity that wasn't real, that had no substance. Or as some docetics believe, Christ took over and inhabited this man, Jesus, spent three years doing amazing things, and then when it was all over, the man to be put to death in the mo was put to death in the most violent way. Does that sound like a God you want to serve? That may help us understand why John is so hard on these deceivers and antichrists. They diminish the saving love and power of God's redemptive work. It minimizes the awfulness of sin. It minimizes God's relationship with humanity. John closes out the book this way, saying, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sisters, sister greet you. Amen. And as we said with the end of Second John, when it talks about coming face to face, uh, the word there could lit literally be translated mouth to mouth, in person. You know, John's relationship with the church was ongoing. He didn't just write a letter and that was it. He had an interest in what they were doing. And John has so much more he wants to say, but he wants to say it in person so that his joy and theirs can be full as we discussed in the book of Second John here. How much better is a face-to-face -face conversation than letters or emails or text? Maybe John's thinking that if he were there in person, the church could be comforted as the apostle himself confronted these antichrists. We have huge things that need to be done, and we use the phrase, let's bring in the big guns. Well, <laughs> in the first century, John was a big gun. At this point, he may have been the last surviving apostle on the face of the planet. And maybe this was John's way of saying, hang on, I am on my way. And that takes us to the book of 3 John. The study of 1 John, we titled, That Your Joy May Be Full. 2 John, we titled, That Our Joy May Be Full, using John's own words uh, from both of those books. For 3 John... We're going to title the study, I Have No Greater Joy. And he says that in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. John again identifies himself as the elder in verse 1, and he addresses the letter to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. <clears throat> J.W. Roberts in his commentary says that Gaius was one of the most common of all Roman names. We understand common names. The U.S. Social Security Administration reports that from 1919 to 2018, the most popular men's name have been, and this is in order from top, at least for the first ten, James, John, Robert, Michael, William, David, Richard, Joseph, Thomas, and Charles. Those are the top ten names over that span of time. Just out of curiosity, I looked up Kevin, because that's my name. It ranks 23rd. During that time, there were 1,169,693 Kevins registered with the Social Security Administration. James, on the other hand, had 4,764,644 people who carried that name during that same time. <clears throat> All that to say is we really don't know who Gaius is. There are some Gaiuses mentioned in the Bible. There's Gaius of Macedonia in Acts 19.29. He's a traveling companion of Paul. There's another Gaius of Derby who was also a traveling companion of Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. And then there's a Gaius uh, who hosted Paul in Corinth in Romans 16 and verse 23. 
And he's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 14 where Paul said, I'm glad that I didn't baptize anyone except, and he included Gaius in that list of people he baptized. That's about as far as we can go with any indication of who Gaius is. Paul calls him, I mean John, excuse me, calls him beloved and states that he loves Gaius in the truth. No doubt he's a leading individual in the church. He's much respected by the apostle, likely respected by his brethren, a good and faithful Christian. Verse 2 reads, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. John prays for Gaius' physical health as well as his spiritual health. And some commentators have suggested that maybe Gaius had health issues like Timothy did. Well, no way for us to know if that's the case or not. Uh, sometimes we just say, be well, and we mean that, not that there's anything wrong at the moment, but just be healthy and well. And maybe that's what John's saying here. Uh, we simply don't know. <clears throat> but the word here indicates that Gaius was prospering spiritually, which is a good sign in light of the problems that have been discussed in 1 John and in 2 John. And add to that verses 2 and 3 where John says, For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. You know, good news is always welcome, isn't it? <clears throat> we hear from a family member or a friend we haven't talked to in a while, and they report that everything's been good with them and that nothing bad has happened, and that fills our heart with joy, and we, we love to hear that kind of good news. We here at Pikes Peak receive good reports from Sekimi and our Nigerian brethren about the growth of the church there in that very difficult part of the world and we're so happy for the success that they're having there as they preach the gospel. You watch the evening news if you can stand to do that anymore and every once in a while there's a feel-good report about someone doing something good and we're surprised that there's any good news out there further surprise maybe that the news will even report that but we're happy to see that, that there is still some good out there in the world. There are still good people trying to do the right things. John got good news about Gaius. <clears throat> the deceivers and the Antichrist apparently hadn't gotten to him. His faith hadn't been shaken, and John is delighted in that to know that he's remaining true to his beliefs. <clears throat> Think back through the epistles that Paul wrote. And how many of those does he greet? and commend and compliment those who are walking in truth. Yeah, Paul addressed issues within the church, and Paul had to be harsh and critical at times to, to get the church back on the right road, but he also talked about good things that were going on and good people in the church who hadn't abandoned the faith. Well, what's the lesson in that for us? Well, when people hear about us personally, is it good news about our faith? Or is it something other than that? When people hear about the Pikes Peak congregation or wherever it is that you worship, do they hear good things or do they hear something else? Not to pat ourselves on the back too hard, but we have a number of new members in the last few months, people who have moved into town and they began to worship with us. And we're delighted to have them here, good families, good people, uh, making Pikes Peak all the better as a group and as a family. A good many of them who came had, through their own contacts, contacts within the church, called and said, hey, we're moving to Colorado Springs, where should we worship? And isn't it nice to know that Pikes Peak was the recommendation that they received, and then they were able to come here and see that that recommendation was good and accurate. Just last Sunday, <clears throat> we had a family visiting from Missouri. The father was a preacher of the Lord's Church there in rural Missouri, and they were coming to, to town on vacation and wanted to know where to worship, so he has a friend who has ties to Bear Valley up in Denver, and so he called him and asked, where's a good place to worship? And Pikes Peak was on the top of the list for this individual who uh, has ties to Bears Valley, Bear Valley. And we're thankful for that, that people know that we can be relied on to be a sound, vibrant, wonderful, welcoming, loyal congregation to the Lord. <clears throat> a brother Dave made a comment a while back that I thought was telling. He was talking about funerals and the things you find out at funerals. He said that it's a shame that you hear so many good things that people did, so many great things, so many wonderful things that you didn't know about in their life, you had to hear it at their funeral. And that kind of resonates, doesn't it? We ought to know one another well enough that we 
hear those good things that you're doing in your life. That we can praise them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Pat somebody on the back when they deserve it. Because we know we have a lot of good people in our family that are doing good things. And every once in a while, everybody needs a word of encouragement. We need to be living such a way that that can be said of us. That we can receive pats on the back. Not that we do it for that reason. But again, every once in a while, it's nice for somebody to say, Hey, you did a good job or I appreciate you. And we should be able to do that with each other because we know what's going on in each other's lives. Gaius got 51 words about him in the New Testament. 51 words. And over the last almost 2,000 years, how is he remembered? In a good way. Remembered for his faithfulness. Remembered for walking in the truth. And he, almost 2,000 years later, is the subject of our discussion in this Bible class this morning. What a legacy. And shouldn't that be our goal? To leave behind that legacy of faithfulness, of walking in the truth, of walking in the commandments, of walking in love, so that people can remember that and be encouraged by that, perhaps long after we're gone. Faithfulness, walking in the truth, walking in the commandments, love one another. These have been the big points that John's made to his audience. And they're the main points we need to take away from these books every time we read them. More importantly, we ought to be imitating these qualities in our lives. Not because Gaius was, or the elect lady was, but because that's just the right thing to do. It's the best thing to do. And it's how we ought to be living our lives so that the church prospers, so that it grows, and it is always what God wants it to be. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our opportunity to be together in this class this morning. We pray this will spur those who are listening on to further study, to dig deeper in the book and learn more about it and to ponder its meaning and to apply those meanings in their lives so that we can all be more faithful to you. Father, bless us as we continue through our activities of this morning online. Be with those who are now meeting in the Pikes Peak Church of Christ building. Keep them safe. Keep them from harm and help them to be encouraged by their time spent together. Let us be a light shining for you in the world. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. We'll begin next Sunday with 3 John chapter or 3 John verse 5 and work our way toward the end of the book and the end of this series we've had on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If we continue our online presence beyond that, and I have no doubt that we will, uh, we will move on to another topic of study that hasn't been decided as of yet. Uh, but we'll let you know, Lord willing, next Sunday what that will be. We hope you'll stay tuned for our worship service that begins at 10 a.m. And until then, from Jude, verses 24 and 25, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see your masked faces this morning. <laughs> masked men and women. I don't know how many are visitors. Just right off, I don't see. Well, yeah, I see a couple of, I think, visitors. The mask covering, I don't know. We will welcome you and hope that you, hope that you enjoy worshiping with us this morning. Let us begin with the Father, these are some auspicious times that we live in at this point. Probably a time that hasn't been seen for centuries. But Lord, we're, we rejoice at being able to worship with your children, your people who have terminated their business and determined that we will assemble 
that we will come together and we will pray together and sing together and praise your name and learn about you and learn more about how we might be able to mold our lives to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you'll help each of us to be encouraged and not lose heart but to resolve that no matter how long it takes, we will get through this strange time. We will be able to once again heartily greet each other with a loving hug, a loving handshake, loving embraces, and enjoy the full fellowship that we have been accustomed to. We ask, Lord, that you'll accept this prayer in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. So we'll sing all three verses of, of Worship the King.
sermon today, Lord, that they have a good understanding of what it is uh, to be a child of God, Lord, and they understand that we are here uh, with them, uh, Lord. But we just thank you for your word, Lord. We just pray that we spend some time in your word throughout this entire week, Lord, that we just have the time to do that, Lord, and that we have a good understanding of uh, your word, Lord, because we understand that that word is what we learn from, uh, from you, Lord, and that we search our hearts uh, throughout this week, uh, Lord, and today, Lord, because we understand that those are going to be the things that are going to make us uh, closer to you, Lord, and bring us closer to your plan, Lord. But we just pray that we have the uh, confidence, uh, Lord, to reach out uh, our hand, Lord, to use our voice, Lord, to talk to someone, to bring them to church the following week, Lord, that we can bring them into your presence, Lord, that we can help them become a child of God, Lord. Lord, we just pray for our leaders around the country, Lord, that they just make the right decisions on behalf of us, Lord. Lord, we just pray that uh, those who don't have a place to worship, Lord, those who don't have a church, those who don't have a house, those who don't have a, uh, the, the internet, Lord, to watch this uh, today, Lord, that they have, that they understand that we are with them, that we are praying for them, and that every step that they go, Lord, that they have uh, you, Lord. Lord, we just pray that uh, you keep a guiding hand over us, Lord, um, all throughout the week, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Preparation for the Lord's Supper will sing number 135. Alas, and did my Savior for the movie this Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred? Sent forth his son. 
In Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. But we also got to remember that Jesus was without sin. We can recall His temptations, yet He was sinless. In Hebrews 4.15, we're told, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet He was without sin. And we always need to remember that Jesus, who is sacrificed, continues to forgive us. And we gave us our sins then, and He forgives us now. And that's why we serve a risen Savior. Pray with you this time. God in heaven, I'm so thankful that Jesus established your church, and you established the kingdom for us. And Father, we have to be mindful that to get there, to warrant that, because sometimes we're not worthy because of the death of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And we remember that this morning, as he took that bread and said, do this remember, remember of me. And Father, we always be mindful of that, that it's because of him we have the hope of eternal life. And Father, we're so grateful that we can serve a risen Savior and he lives today. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Apart from our Lord's Supper every first day of the week, we have an opportunity to give back of our blessings, and the elders have a lot of uh, some platforms for us to give. Here is a basket there, well, there's a basket there, and I think one over here. And also, we can do it online if you're uh, listening to our service this morning, and also you can do it by mail. So there's a lot of ways we can give back, and at this time, we'd like to be given with a uh, Thankful hearts and also for uh, some unselfish hearts. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we come against uh, we come to you and, and we bow to you to be thankful for the blessings you give us, spiritual blessings, physical blessings, and all the things that we have belong to you. And we thank you, Father, for allowing us to be able to do that. And Father, we ask that you use these funds to further your kingdom. And by that, that you would be willing to give with a willing and giving hearts. In your son's name we pray. Amen. to sing, O Thou Fount of Every Blessing, but if you'd like to mark number 566, that's going to be our song after the lesson, number 566. Oh, we have words, I'm sorry. Ah, never mind that. <laughs> we'll sing that one. <laughs> o Thou Fount of Every Blessing, my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and Constrained to be 
Let thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Will the distresses of this nation go unheeded? 
Let us therefore determine to seek his face. The story goes, they promptly got down on their knees, and when they arose from prayer, that slogan was born, Ye plural the soon about it out of one, or one out of many. From our Declaration of Independence, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to, to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate needful stations to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the cause which impels them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed with their creator with uncertain and unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That Declaration of Independence was signed what would have been yesterday in 1776. And it's today we celebrate our independence. And that cry of freedom, that, that knowledge of freedom has been around now for about 244 years. And I know we all agree we hope it's around for another 200 and 44 years. Sometimes we hear patriotic speeches and we see bumper stickers and shirts that say, proud to be an American. And I know we all are proud to be an American. But just for the sake of our time together this morning, maybe we ought to better say we're grateful to be an American. You see, we could have been born in Bosnia or China or Pakistan or India. If you want to know what India is like, talk to Savannah. She has first-hand information of what it's like to live in India. We could be wondering where our next meal was coming from, yet we're sitting here in a nice church building, air-conditioned church building with padded pews, surrounded by wonderful people who are dressed nice and smell nice and, well, for most of us, look nice. And it's a, it's a blessing to be here in this country. I am grateful to be a citizen of the United States of America, and I hope that you are too. A father was talking to his rather rebellious son, and he said, every person who lives in the United States is a privileged person. To which the petulant lad said, I disagree, and the father said, that's the privilege. We have the privilege to disagree. We have the privilege to speak our mind. We have the freedom of religion, of speech, of the press. We have the freedom to hope and dream and pursue our dreams. We are free in so many ways, and that's because of what the founding fathers have done for us. You and I didn't earn the privilege that we enjoy as citizens of this land. The poet expressed it well. We eat from orchards we did not plant, drink from wells we did not dig, reap from fields we did not sow, warmed by fires that we did not kindle, or sheltered by roofs we did not build. We are blessed by monies we did not give. And so hopefully some of those thoughts resonated with you, uh, considering that yesterday was the, the actual 4th of July and we celebrated our independence on that day. But you know, thinking spiritually this morning, because of God's grace, we have a greater freedom than any constitution can grant us. We have freedom that's offered through Jesus Christ. There's a word for freedom in the New Testament. That word's redemption. Redemption means to be set free. It means that we have been bought with a price. We have been freed from our bondage and are now truly free from that bondage of sin. Gospel is a message of freedom. It's a message of good news. It's a message of good news for the poor. A message of good news of freedom for the prisoners. Sight for the blind. The release from the oppressed. It's a message that's still needed today because there are far too many people who are still not free. Far too many people who are still not redeemed. I love the words of Jesus recorded there in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So the obvious question to ask this morning, are you free today? And if not, we hope you'll think about doing something about that situation. You can be free, because Jesus can make you free. You can be free indeed, to use the wording there of the New King James Version. You notice in that text that Joseph read for us, the reaction that Jesus gets from the Jews and notice verse 31 says, these are Jews who believed in him. So these are not his devout enemies. These are not the Sadducees and the Pharisees and those who are seeking to destroy him. These are people who had already somewhat embraced him at this point in time. Notice the disconnect that they had when it was said, we are Abraham's descendants and never been in bondage to anyone. Verse 33. And you think, well, wait a minute. What about Egypt? What about Babylon? What about your Roman overlords 
that you're under bondage to right now. They were prideful of their state. And they said, we've never been in bondage. And Jesus, I'm sure, was thinking, well, yes, you have. Most importantly, you're in bondage to sin. They, as everyone else who has ever lived, had sinned. Romans 3 and verse 23. So how do you recognize freedom? What symbolizes freedom for you? For people in Berlin, the wall not being there symbolizes freedom. Those of you who are from Texas or like Texas, wasn't the Alamo a ringing cry of freedom uh, for the people of that, of that great state? Some people think of freedom when they hear the Star Spangled Banner or Ray Charles sing God Bless America or America the Beautiful and Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. Maybe to the millions and millions of immigrants, it's the Statue of Liberty uh, that symbolizes freedom or Old Glory or the Bald Eagle or whatever it is that symbolizes freedom to you. With all the symbols for freedom, though, there's one symbol that stands far above all the rest. Where other symbols are connected to the country, a group of people, there is one symbol of freedom that is for every person who lives, no matter where they live and no matter when they live, and that is the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have been given freedom by God. Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins and give us freedom. The cross is the symbol of life-changing, everlasting freedom. More than bald eagles, more than old glory, more than the Statue of Liberty, the cross is truly the symbol of freedom. To borrow some words from Lee Greenwood's song, with slightly different words, I'm proud to be a Christian, because at least I know I'm free, and I won't forget the man who died to gave that life, who gave that life to me. If the Son makes you free, you are free Indeed. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we're here every Sunday morning and every time we have the opportunity because we're enjoying and celebrating that freedom we have because of the cross of Jesus Christ. What happens if America becomes a nation no longer under God? Some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, it's already there. And that might be a valid point. What happens if America no longer becomes one nation under God? Would we be like the church under the Roman Empire? Would we be like the church under the oppressive rule of the Roman Catholic Church during the Middle Ages? Would we be a marginalized and highly regulated, disdainfully tolerated social club? What would happen if we are no longer one nation under God? Let's think about that for a minute. You know, Christianity... And they use that term in its broadest, uh, broadest implication. It's been around for 1,987 years. That is, the day 1833 is when the church was truly established. But it's only enjoyed its American elevated status for 244 years at that time. And yet, no matter the historical setting, no matter the time, the church has continued and at times thrived. It has never been destroyed long before America was an ideal in the minds of humanity. How did they survive? How did the church survive under the brutal oppression of Rome? Well, I think those people understood not their independence, but their dependence on God. Not on state religion, not on government approval, not on the fact of what was popular at the moment. The church survived because it depended on God to the exclusion of everything else. And if our nation becomes no longer one nation under God, how will we survive? By depending upon God for the independence He's offered us. We don't want it to go back that way, do we? I don't. I know you don't. I don't want it to be like it was under Nero or Domitian. Or under the oppressive rule of the Middle Ages. Why? Why don't I want it to go back that way? Well, I think the reason's obvious, but let's think about a couple of things. Maybe, I'll speak for me, maybe I wonder if it's no longer one nation under God, will I be able to remain faithful under those circumstances? Will my faith be strong enough to see me through that difficult? Maybe we doubt we can handle the stress and the ostracism, the outright hostility perhaps that many people might have toward us 
as religion gets pushed further and further from the center of our society. Maybe we've become so comfortable in our easy religion, we might not be able to handle a religion that becomes hard and difficult to practice and dangerous to practice. Those inalienable rights that our forefathers talked about have existed from God since the beginning. We in America have only witnessed one of the few times in history when the government has actually acknowledged those God-given rights. And I think it would boil down to the core of who we are. Thousands upon thousands of our brethren in the world who are worshiping today do not enjoy the freedoms that we do. And you know what the ironic thing is? The place where the church is growing the fastest is not here in the good old U.S. of A. But it's in those places where it's hard to be a Christian. Where it's difficult to practice faith. Where life isn't as good as it is here. And somehow in many of those places the church is flourishing. And we ask the question, well, why is that? Well, maybe because they have not the things we do. But they have dependence on God that motivated the church no matter what the external circumstances are. So what does that mean for us? Well, first of all, we need to pray that our freedom continues. I think that would be a good thing, and I think we would all agree with that. To be grateful for what we have. But perhaps more importantly, we need to look deep within ourselves and evaluate our own level of dependence on God. We are a pretty self-sufficient society. If you don't know how to do something, what do you do? Go to YouTube. And it will tell you. We, we have everything at our, our, our fingertips of what we need to survive. Has that self sufficiently displaced our dependence on God, perhaps? To where we don't really rely on Him except for the big things. You know, we lose a job, we get sick, we have family problems, we have money problems. Yeah, we need God then, but for everything else, I can handle it. I'm on top of this. I've got it. Things are good. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice those two words. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, I would call those all-inclusive words. Nothing means nothing. Everything means everything. Be anxious for nothing. In everything, by prayer and supplication. There's no exceptions to either one of those words. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Everything, no exception to the word everything. And he talks about by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. First Thessalonians 5, verse 17, we're told pray without ceasing. The word supplication, uh, it can be translated entreaty. It's a word that seems to indicate, and this is Kevin's deep technical Greek explanation prayer on steroids. It's not just prayer, it's an entreaty. It's a begging, it's a longing for the answer to the prayer uh, that, is being, that is being expressed. I liken it to Hannah as she was there praying desperately to have a son. Wanting that so desperately that she was unaware of her surroundings, unaware that her lips were moving and the priest was misjudging her based on that. She wanted it so bad. It was a supplication, it was an entreaty. With thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what God has done in the past. Thanksgiving for what God is doing now. Thanksgiving for what God will do prayerfully in the future. We need to be praying. That prayer makes it possible for us to not be anxious. It makes us realize as we're on our knees that I depend on God for everything. And without Him, I am and will be nothing. I can be nothing without God. John 16 and verse 24, ask and you will receive. James said you don't have because you don't ask. James chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 John 5 and verse 5. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. 
Maybe today should be our declaration of dependence rather than a declaration of independence. I depend on my Father God. Prayers and entreaties are a good indication of our dependence on God. Daniel had so practiced prayer that his enemies knew that it was in his religious life, in his prayer life. That was the only way they could get to him. Because in every way he was moral, he was upright, he was just, he did right. They couldn't get at him in any way except for his prayer life. And so they cooked up the scheme, you remember. That nobody could pray to anybody but King Darius for 30 days. And then they sat back, I'm sure, rubbing their hands, thinking, we got him now. And they got him. Because you know what Daniel did. The minute he heard of the decree, he went up to his room, he opened his windows facing towards Jerusalem, and what did he do? He didn't pray to Darius. And he ended up in the lion's den. Didn't keep the prayer, didn't keep the sashes closed, the window closed, didn't do it in hiding, but boldly and openly declared his dependence on God at the risk of his own personal safety. Maybe here's something we need to think about. We pray that we don't end up in the lion's den. And that's a good prayer. None of us want to be there. But maybe, maybe the lion's den isn't so bad when they can't eat you. Maybe we ought to be praying for vegan lions when we're in the lion's den. We pray so much for no lion's den that when we're in the lion's den, we don't know what to do and realize that the effectiveness of our prayer in the lion's den is just as effective as prayer that could keep us out of the lion's den. Let's pray and demonstrate our dependence on God. Not my independence. Because really, my independence I'm not so good at. Are you? But God is good at everything He does. And He's told us, if you ask me, I'll answer that prayer. We live in the greatest country on earth, in my opinion. I will say that to my dying day. I'm grateful that I was born here, grateful that I get to live here, grateful that I raised my family and get to see my grandkids grow up in this country, even though things seem awful right now. We have to understand, however, that the greatness of the good old USA cannot compare with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8 and verse 18 from Jesus Christ. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Dependence on God is how we will get to where we want to be. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's John 14, verses 1 through 3. Dependence on God will get us to heaven. And may we ever ever realized how much we depend on God, how much we need Him, and the freedom and the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you don't have that freedom, if you don't have that redemption, we hope and pray you'll give serious thought to doing something about it. If you don't know what to do, ask. We'll be glad to show you not what we believe, but what the Word says about that salvation. Or maybe you're ready to make that decision. One of our elders will be standing down front while John leads us in the invitation song. All you have to do is step out of the aisle and come forward and we'll deal with your needs as best we can right here and right now. Maybe where you're sitting you realize I haven't really been dependent on God. I've been really independent. And maybe it's time to rectify that. And maybe you need to do that right where you stand or when you get home or with your family or whatever the case may be. Today is the day of our declaration of dependence. We need God. We can't live without Him. And most assuredly, we can't go to heaven without Him. And that's where we all want to be. And if we help you in that regard in any way, now would be a good time to express that as together we stand and sing. So, the Savior, thou art needy. So, the Savior waits for thee. Words of tender pleading, hear his gracious come to me. He is calling, softly calling on thy ear. His voice is falling, he is calling, softly calling, come to me.
is calling, softly calling, on thine ear his voice is falling, he is calling, softly calling, come to me and be at As we uh, may, may have heard, I just wanted to uh, repeat, uh, this will be uh, Savannah Church's last day here, or uh, uh, with last weekend with us here. She's going to be uh, traveling to Minnesota to her new job there, her new home. Uh, and, I, and I believe uh, uh, Joe and Dana and probably Elise will be uh, traveling there with her to help her out for a few days, get her established. Uh, Savannah, we... Uh, uh, want to wish you well there, and uh, and and let you know that we'll, you'll be in our prayers, and and uh, and you go with our love. Our closing song this morning will be "Angels Are Singing." Let's just sing one verse of that, and we'll have prayer and some announcements. Angels are singing redemption sweet song, wonderful theme, glorious theme. Shout the glad message and join in the throng, singing redemption song. Sing the sweet story, redemption sweet song. Over and over the chorus prolong. Shout the glad message and join with the throng. Ever will sing praise to the King, singing redemption song. Would you all bow your age, please? Father, we come to you this morning as, as a group of Christians in this location. Father, we worship you because we know that everything is under your power. We know that your son came and died for each and every one of us. We know for a fact, Father, that you love us more than we could ever comprehend. We know, Father, that you see inside of our hearts, inside of our minds. You see our dedication to you. You see our love for you. You see our desire to have you in our hearts, in our minds, to help us make the right decisions, to help us love and to respect in a way that honors you. Father, you have been through the Christians throughout the ages. You have seen the death of all of your children. You have seen the trying times that they have to go through. You see where people either have a tangential relationship with you or whether it's deep. We pray, Father, for this nation and we pray for the world over. Father, we pray that the Christians all over this globe would realize that you are always in charge. That there is nothing that is hidden from you, nothing that is outside of your bounds. Father, no matter where, where we are on this planet, we know to be thankful to you for the hope of salvation through your Son. We pray for leaders in this nation, Father, who will bow the knee to you. We pray that for the people of this land that they will realize that without you there is no hope of salvation without Christ. We pray, Father, that you would help us to have a right mind and a right heart as we deal with those around about us. Father, give us the strength and the wisdom to conduct ourselves in a way that honors you 
to respond to others with words that demonstrate our love and respect for your word. Father, we know again that these are trying times, but we know, Father, that your sin has overcome this world. Help us to be strong in the faith. Help us to be wiser in the word. Help us not to have just a, a generalized understanding of you, but Father, help us to dig deep into your word and into prayer. In the request and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us to do those things that are right. Father, help us to live and to love and to serve you always, no matter what the trials, no matter what the tribulations, and no matter what the good times. Help us to love each other, to respect each other, and to remember that your presence, the ability to be with you throughout eternity, is worth everything that we have to go through. Forgive our sins. Help us to stay strong for our children, for our friends, for those who do not know you. And we're so thankful for everything that you do. And we pray for the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, and we have these few announcements to share with you, and we'll go ahead and say it again for those of you who are part of our Pikes Peak family, the very best way to keep up with what's happening with us is to be on the church bulletin email list, and the email list that includes all the different announcements that we send out from the church office several times each and every week, and we trust that you'll take advantage of that open line of communication. But we will mention these this morning. Our sister Peggy Harrison has experienced shoulder and arm and hand and wrist pain, and she's been to the ER, and they tested for blood clots and ruled that out, but she still doesn't know what's wrong. And a very painful, uncomfortable situation. Tony and Peggy, they've had a time these last six months or so. And we've been praying for Tony. And now we'll include Peggy. And our prayer is that this pain situation will be remedied very soon. And Tony and Peggy have been getting out the last couple of Sunday mornings, and so good to see them back in the building, but here's a setback, and something that we want to remember in our prayers. As well as our brother Jim Meacham, brother Jim fell recently, broke a rib. Some of you may know firsthand how painful that is when you move, and when you breathe, and we regret so very much that our brother Jim is going through this difficult time along with his faithful wife and companion Naomi. We're praying for them, and Sister Janice Johnson, Mona, and her twin sister Lona, and Lona suffering from a brain tumor and the treatment and the care, and we want to remember her. The Ramsey's great-grandson Sawyer continues to recover from his most recent operation. And perhaps he will strengthen and get better every single day that goes by. Sister Marlene Bowers, and we sent out this message just yesterday, I think, but the nursing home that Sister Marlene is in, that care facility, they've had a lady that's been diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus. And so once again, that facility is closed. Strict security with the different ones staying in their rooms, even their meals are being brought to them. And Sister Marlene, as well as Sister Vanita, 
And Jackie, those that are in those care facilities, they can no doubt tell us that at best, that's something of a challenging situation. And now with the lockdown, there's even more of a challenge, and we'll pray that these days may be shortened. Our brother Bob McConkie, up at the Woodland Park congregation. Woodland Park is now back to holding Sunday morning services, and we rejoice in that for so many weeks. Uh, Pikes Peak and Woodland Park, we worship together on the YouTube stream, you know, and most of us, we know Brother Bob. His mother died recently down in Florida, so Bob and Terry are down there taking care of those necessary details with a heavy heart. And we want to pray that the Lord's comfort might be upon them. This afternoon at the church building down in the fellowship room, there's a wedding shower for Thomas and Lydia. And the fellowship room is all ready with social distancing. And you will be asked to wear a mask. And these are different days. And maybe there is a bit of good times and rejoicing as we celebrate with Thomas and Lydia this afternoon. And if you're not able to attend, uh, just check with the church office and You'll find out where they're registered, and you can add your blessing and best wishes to this young couple as they plan their wedding and the days are drawing short. And this afternoon, those who are able will meet with them and rejoice and have that good time. We've received a thank you note, a couple of thank you notes. And here's one from Janelle Ball that I'll read for us. And Janelle says, I appreciate you. The knee replacement surgery is certainly a challenge. Yet from the very first day of surgery, your love and thoughtfulness has been with me. A lovely purple flowered plant reminded me of you while I was in the hospital. And then cards, calls, texts, emails, food deliveries kept popping up after I came home. Each one shows how much you care. Each prayer asks for blessings. Thank you for your outpouring of love. And we're so glad that Janelle is recovering. Barbara Bagwell is recovering from her foot surgery. And Barbara can have visitors now in her rehab center. Still a little bit of a restriction. She can have two at a time. And we have to call ahead or email to schedule those. And there's only one lady at that facility that is orchestrating and scheduling and keeping up with those details. And she's pretty much swamped, as you might imagine. And if you don't have that contact information and you're wanting to visit Barbara, well, just contact the church office. And we'll send that just as quickly as we can to you. Sister Marlene Bowers, in her care facility, her nursing home, there has been at least one person diagnosed with the COVID virus. And so she's under lockdown again. And I'm sure Marlene and Sister Vanita and Sister Jackie those three sweet sisters living in those care facilities, they could tell us that that's a challenge, even in the best of times. And now, under the lockdown, it's even more of a challenge. And we'll pray for Sister Marlene that these days might be shortened. We also received a thank you note from Philip and Irita James. And I think that's printed in our church bulletin this week that you're getting by email, remember. And some of our ladies made face masks and sent down to the Navajo Reservation. 
and the virus is especially fierce down in that part of our world and the Navajo culture coming together and that close communal setting there's so many that's been afflicted and the news is in the paper all the time about that situation well our ladies with a tender loving heart has mailed down that care package of face mask and other things and Philip and I Rita they want to let us know how very much they appreciate that and they say thank you and now then looking over my list I'm fairly certain that I've forgotten or overlooked something but these are matters that are close to us and some of these more recent developments let's look out for one another let's hold one another up in prayer let's take care of one another so much as we can during these days because we are family and because we've all been washed in the blood of the Lamb and filled with the Spirit, and because we have one heart, one mind, one purpose, one calling, and that makes each one precious to us all. Until the next time, that's Wednesday night Bible study right here on YouTube at 6.30 p.m. May the Lord continue to bless and keep us all.